really before there was George Washington, there was Dr. Joseph Warren. So Warren is president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, head of the Committee of Safety. He's the Grand Master of Ancient Scottish Rite Masons throughout North America. He delivers two fiery Boston massacre orations. He authors the Suffolk Resolves. He's a propagandist. He's writing political arguments and tracts. He's a spy master. He sends Revere and Dawes out on their midnight rides. I mean, he's really doing it all voice, pen, and sword. And that's why he's such an important figure, but in the pre-revolutionary era. And I think so many histories kind of trace the starting point of the revolution, either to the massacre or the Tea Party. But for 10 years before the Declaration of Independence is signed, Warren is resisting these oppressive British policies. And uh, what got me into the book, I mean, I had always heard about Warren's name, you know, it's just a sentence here, a sentence there. You never read much about him. I think at the time there were two full length um, nonfiction biographies written about him in, in over 200 years. And, you know, you start thinking, you know, he's, he's wearing all these hats, he's doing all these things, he's participating in these battles and skirmishes. You know, why don't we know more about him? Why is it? Why is someone like Paul Revere a household name, but the guy who actually sends Paul Revere on the ride, the one who's responsible for this shot heard around the world, nobody's heard anything about him, and he's just obscure. So this predates George Washington's Secret Six. It predates Nathan Hale. And again, you're not gonna have a lot of evidence, right? If someone's actually conducting these spy activities, people are pushing information up the chain of command. But, you know, we have several primary source references talking about them spying on the British, gathering intelligence and giving this information to Dr. Joseph Warren. So, I mean, and again, it's 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 his decision to send out Revere and Dawes on the ride based on certain intelligence, you know, and, and he's basically, he's feeding this information to these founding fathers at the first Continental Congress. He's, he, right, he's the eyes and ears of those men there. When, when you read these letters from the founding fathers in Philadelphia at this time, you know, they're writing to Warren, asking him what's going on, what should we do, what do you need? You know, they're really relying on him. And when you read these letters, you re it's amazing to see, wow, the, these are the founding fathers and they're really kind of relying on Warren to guide them at this point. We know, gauging from his medical records, that he's treating every social rung of that ladder, right? So he's treating ship captains, he's treating slaves, he's treating farmers. You know, he, he's got patients in there that he calls a lemon seller. You know, he's treating Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor. He's treating, you know, the Oliver family, the Hallowells, the Fluckers. So, you know, again, when you, when you look into his medical world, his business, his career, he really is and all these, you, you know, you start to draw these concentric circles, right? He's in these different social circles. He's in different military circles. He's with different people who are wealthy, who are poor. And, and really, that, I mean, I think that's what makes him such an attractive figure to both sides of the political battle, because he's someone who's educated. He's someone who's well-respected. And think about it, right? He, he's sa he's helping to save people's lives. He, he's treating them. You know, this is it's so ironic because we kind of remember him as a guy who's fighting and killing at Bunker Hill and Lexington and Concord. But, you know, he spends his life trying to save other people's lives and trying to heal other people. So there's this sort of this twist of irony involved. It, I mean, he really is a complex figure, right? And, yes. and you, yeah. you just wish that you had some more of his private letters. And that was the whole point of the book, to try and really really dig into his personal life and not so much his public career. So basically, you know, in a nutshell, there was a shortage of, of hard money. In, in the Bay Colony in the late 1730s, early 1740s. So a group of men get together and they decide that they're gonna create this land bank, which is basically paper currency, right? They will accept notes of currency that's gonna be backed by land. Now, the problem is these wealthy merchants, these wealthy politicians, 
they want to concentrate the money into their in their hands. They want they don't want people doing this. So they reach out right. to Parliament for help in dissolving the land bank. Now, when you read biographies about Samuel Adams, talk to historians about Samuel Adams, a lot of them will point to this land bank controversy as to one of the reasons that Samuel Adams became such a vehement uh, patriot, because his father was one of the principal investors and founders of this land bank controversy. Now, Parliament is successful in dissolving the land bank, and this spells financial ruin for so many of the men who were involved. And what we really didn't know before this was that one of the principal investors was Dr. Joseph Warren's maternal grandfather, who he becomes very close with. So from the early 1740s until his death in the 1760s, this Dr. Samuel Stevens, Warren's grandfather, is being dragged into court. He's being sued. It, it, basically, it's a financial disaster for him. He has to sell tracts of land, personal possessions, farm animals. He's pleading to the courts for help, for relief, saying he has no more money. He's basically sold everything. So Warren would have seen this growing up. Now, think about it. When his grandfather does die in the 1760s, Warren's in his 20s. So Warren saw this firsthand, so you can see this is really one of the first instance, instances of Parliament dipping their fingers into the colonists' pockets to help dissolve this land bank. And really, this would have, you have to think it would have caused a lot of resentment on Warren's part to see his grandfather suffer like this, and as a consequence, his own family. This is a declaration of rights and grievances that, that Warren authors because of these um, coercive acts that are passed as a result to punish the colonists for the Tea Party, right? And and one of the biggest one was closing the port of Boston. And, you know, we have this letter from that's written by Warren's fiance that was written the day the, the port is being closed. And it, I mean, it's almost catastrophic through her eyes, right? How How is this... How is this town of Boston, how is this colony going to survive if we're ba basically it's a stranglehold on their economy? So the incredible thing is that, you know, on, on one of his lesser famous rides, Paul Revere is chosen by Warren to dispatch this document to the Continental Congress. And, and what's always amazing to me is that when Revere arrives, this is in September of 74, we know that the assembled delegates are not all on the same page. Right? There's a lot of divisiveness, there's a lot of bickering, but the incredible thing is that every single delegate to the Continental Congress adopts these Suffolk resolves unanimously. And that's why when people say, well, the founders didn't know who Warren was, well, they all knew who Warren was. They all admired him to an extent because of these Suffolk resolves, because he creates this atmosphere of harmony and unity, unity at this first Continental Congress and, and, and they ride that through. So, you know, it, it's it really, it really is a precursor document to the Declaration of Independence. And if you read some of the language in there and, and some of the things he's saying, like we must prepare, we have to unite, we have to arm ourselves. I mean, these are really radical things at this time period that not a lot of people are saying, you know, keep in mind the declaration is right. going to come about a year and a half later. But, you know, at this point, you still have the delegates talking about Olive Branch petitions yes. you know the yep. colony of yep. massachusetts is becoming a problem making problems for for everyone else so when you really look at this document in hindsight it really is an incredible uh, piece of work Washington gets the news of Warren's death and, and the Battle of Bunker Hill as he's traveling to Cambridge. I think he's somewhere in New York when he gets the news. And then basically all the delegates at the Continental Congress get word of Warren's death a week after the battle. And really Warren had no business being at this battle. I mean, I, I think it's just as ludicrous to expect like our major politicians going over to Afghanistan and fighting in tanks and doing uh, troop movements Absolutely. as it was yep. back then. And, and everyone who Warren knew implored him not to go to this battle, not to risk himself because he was so important because he wore so many hats and because these guys were way in Philadelphia, he becomes the on the ground leader. And you really see it create this vacuum. And even I think 
think it was like even 20 years later, a play had been written uh, and Warren was in it and John Adams was president at the time and the play was in New York City and he says, he basically states like you, you depict Warren as a, as, a, as a bully and he was really offended by that. But I think you're right. I think a lot of these guys, once they found out how Warren's body was treated, once they found out he was killed, I think that was a real turning point where there really is no turning back at this point for a lot of the guys, that they're just repulsed by this. General Warren is fallen at Bunker Hill. Shot through the head. Bayoneted and stripped of his clothes. I knew him, gentlemen. He was my physician. The full measure of British atrocity is too terrible to relate. 400 patriots dead. Not professional soldiers, gentlemen. Ordinary citizens of Massachusetts who willingly gave their lives to defend what was rightfully theirs, their liberty. But they took with them more than a thousand British soldiers and 100 of their officers. Initially, it made sense because you had some real serious historians who speculated about it mm, and said, you okay. know, this could have been one of the women that was feeding Warren information. But then you had some other people come along and start making these innuendos that there could have been a romantic relationship. And, and, and that's how these things breathe life. But right. no, it was disproven. Uh, we still don't know who the daughter of Liberty was. You know, I speculated that it could have been uh, Lucy Flucker. Uh, Henry Knox's wife, uh, JL ah. Bell, disagrees with me, so we're a little, uh, <laughs> you're butting heads there, a little yeah. bit over that, but you know, I mean, JL Bell's scholarship, I mean, he, you know, he, no one's doing it like him, but but I think there is a, a possibility that could be, John doesn't agree with me, but um, we, we don't know, that's the bottom line, but yeah, again, there is no truth to that, to that rumor. There's four that I know of. There's one in Warren, PA. Uh, there's one at the Bunker Hill Monument inside. Um, there is one that's at Roxbury Latin School. That's right outside, and that's Warren's alma mater. And then there was one that was just dedicated at his um, his his uh, burial place in Forest Hill Cemetery. And that was just dedicated about four years ago by the Freemasons of Massachusetts. So there's actually four statues that exist. Um, to him now and uh you know whenever you really see a uh you know a warren county a warren street a warren avenue like you know 99 times out of 100 it's going to be named after him <laughs>